So today I have the pleasure to host uh, Dr. Steinar Breen, dialogue worker and peace builder, who is recognized as one of the most experienced dialogue facilitators in Europe. We will talk about the reconciliation as a process in general, but also with a particular focus on the Western Balkans, as well as about the importance of dialogue in general. So finally, we'll try to draw some parallels between reconciliation in the Western Balkans, Norway, and elsewhere. Steiner Brin is a dialogue worker and peace builder who has been a teacher, researcher, and acting principal at the Nansen Academy in Lillehammer, Norway. After graduating from the University of Wisconsin, he obtained a PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. During the last 20 years, Steiner has developed and supported the Nansen Dialogue Centers in the Western Balkans. He is responsible for the planning and implementing of inter-ethnic dialogue seminars in Norway and in the Western Balkans. For his work, Steiner has been nominated seven times for the Nobel Peace Prize. He is currently a mentor for the Nansen Dialogue Network. Mr. Breen, welcome to the Lighthouse podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe to start off by asking you if you can share your journey and what inspired you to focus on dialogue and peace building, and in particular in our region here in the Western Balkans. I can um, tell you, I was very fascinated by um, a man. I wrote a thesis about him in uh, my high school, and he was the founder of the Nansen Academy, and then 1935 in Germany. And he got so uh, scared of the possibility of war in Europe that he wanted to establish a, a humane counter force. So he established the Nansen Academy as an academy for peace and reconciliation. In 1994, Lillehammer, my hometown, hosted the Winter Olympics. That brought us in contact with Sarajevo that hosted the Winter Olympics in 1984. So people from my town traveled to uh, Sarajevo. And what was important, we were not United Nations. We were not NATO. We were not European Union. <clears throat> we were some kind of Olympic friends. So it was very natural in 94, the war was going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was very natural for us to ask, is there anything we can do to support, to help, to, to rebuild trust, communication, cooperation between people? And we started in 1995 to invite Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks, uh, Bosnians, from Bosnia Herzegovina to the Nansen Academy in Lillehammer and discovered very fast that this was not only about Bosnia Herzegovina, it was about the breakdown of all of Yugoslavia. So if we wanted to understand this conflict, we would have to invite people from Ljubljana to Skopje. What was unique and special? People came here for three months. That's a long conversation. I probably think I am the person in Europe that I've listened to most stories in terms of what did people experience in those years. And uh, we developed a very strong focus on Kosovo because Dayton was in November 95, but the Kosovo crisis was not solved. And we had many, many groups, uh, Serbs, Albanians from Kosovo coming to Lillehammer all in all, over these years, around 3,000 people from um, old Yugoslavia have been on my veranda in my home. And probably I've also had uh, a few hundred seminars in Okrid, in Budva, in uh, Herzegnovi, in the towns uh, in, uh, in the Western Balkan. So in terms of trying to bring people together to sit and talk, share stories. I feel very experienced. And then, of course, you can ask, what was the result? What came out of that? 
And uh, uh, precisely, I want to ask you about that. Um, as, as a mentor for the Nansen Dialogue Network, can you tell us how does the Nansen Dialogue approach uh, utilize dialogue as a tool for reconciliation in conflict areas? And can you explain maybe the core principles and methodologies of the Nansen Dialogue Center? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think what was, let's say, the essence when people came to the Nansen Academy, it's a very small, imagine a small college for only 100 students. You have a dormitory, you have eating, dining facilities, you have educational rooms. So when people came here, they lived together. So if we put up, let's say, a basketball net, uh, Serbs, Albanians would start to shoot the basket. I hate you as a Serb, but sure, you can shoot. We would go to a jazz concert. Wow, you like jazz too. Uh, we would do cross-country skiing. And uh, I would ask, what is the difference between the Serbian and the Albanian way of cross-country skiing? No, no, it's not about that. What is the di I really challenge people to define... What is this ethnic difference you are so concerned about? And it was very, very difficult for people to explain it. And uh, the, most, the most thorough, I think, effect the ethnic organization of reality was slowly broken down. It didn't make sense because the most important division because we had people we had bosnians we had albanians serbs croats the most important division between people was between those more traditional and those more modern between those who wanted to let's say move toward european union uh, emphasizing freedom traveling uh, in a way the more western capitalistic way and those emphasizing the more traditional family, community, uh, etc. And that division is very real in the world today, in Afghanistan, between uh, Palestine and Israel. Tel Aviv is ultra modern, uh, Gaza is very traditional. If we don't understand that the tension between tradition and modernity is that something we must take seriously and not just say one is right, one is wrong. How can we somehow uh, combine? I also think when we had the dialogue meetings, the very important conversation was what made you who you are? What are the stories you heard from your grandfather? What did you experience as a child? Three years, four years, five years old? What movies what books did you read what formed and shaped your view of the world and when people told those stories it kind of made sense because if you're born in south mitrovica in kosovo you grow up in an albanian reality if you are born in north mitrovica you grow up in a serbian reality the stories you get are so different and we need to understand to be born in Tel Aviv or to be born in Gaza City is completely different. And if these people don't meet to share the stories, the narratives they've been told, whether it's Mitrovica, Mostar, South Serbia, you know, whatever, we have these conflicts as well as in, uh, in uh, Norway. But when you listen to somebody with a completely different background and they tell about that background, you start to understand, if I had been you, maybe I had, would have been th thinking like you. Maybe I would have been looking at the world like you mm -hmm. do. Interesting. I think the other, the other essential conversation is about the consequences of a conflict. So people tend to think we are the victims, you are the perpetrator. But when people start to talk about what is the price? What is the consequence? Both sides, you know, Serbs, Albanians, 
Bosnians, Croats, Serbs, they all pay a price for the war. And when you realize in one way, we are all victims of this, there is no real winner. So to continue a war doesn't really, really create a big change. We can absolutely now talk about Bosnia-Herzegovina, 1993. There was a peace plan that was uh, <clears throat> neglected by Visebegovic, and we had two more years of war, and we got the Dayton Agreement. But was the Dayton Agreement so different from the stoltenberg oven plan in 93 that it can justify two more years? And the reason I'm, I'm saying that is that <clears throat> we are now in Ukraine talking about negotiations and there is no willingness to negotiate but what i'm trying to say is that okay we can have two more years of war but probably the negotiated deal will be about the same as what we can manage today or even could have managed a year ago uh, maybe to bring you back to the western balkans um concretely because as you said uh, uh, you worked uh, there um, through the Nansen Dialogue Centers for the last 20 years, even more. And uh, we, we could say that many of us uh, in the region uh, are aware of the dysfunctionality still of our states and institutions. But the, the question is not so that as well, but whether everyone understands the reasons for such instability and malfunction. Can we connect the dots with the past in that sense? And uh, uh, I wanted to ask you is, uh, are people actually aware uh, of the importance of the dialogue? And, uh, and uh, linked to this, um, if they are, and if they're still skeptical about it, how do you address the resistance, that resistance and skepticism towards dialogue initiatives? Um, I think you are right. I think that people are not aware of the importance of uh, dialogue. There is a book that was written actually by the director of the CIA, William Burns. We're not talking about a radical NGO worker. We're talking about the head of CIA. And that book is called Backstage. And he says, the biggest mistake we maybe did in the 21st century was the neglection of diplomacy and dialogue. Because we try to solve problems in Libya, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, now also in uh, Ukraine, or for that matter, in, you know, in, in Kosovo. Uh, but without the diplomatic skills more by force. And he says, if the world is going to manage to, in a way, survive, we have to rebuild the trust in diplomacy and dialogue, and we have to strengthen our skills. As I said, I've done a lot of dialogue work in Serbia, in South Serbia, beyond what, Preševo, in, uh, in Kosovo. And I believe that dialogue is a powerful tool, but I also felt all the time that people were thinking dialogue is a little bit, uh, um, one diplomat said, womanish. Dialogue is not powerful enough. Dialogue did not get the support it deserved. Dialogue has not failed in Kosovo or in Serbia. It has just not been tried properly. I uh, had a good friend who made a, a movie, Reunion. It's about a dialogue group in Kosovo, Serbs, Albanians. And he makes a movie in 99, 10 days before the bombing. And then he gathers the same people to watch the movie uh, 12 years later and is asking, did the war give us the society we wanted? Did we succeed with the way we were you know, going forward? And basically, in Libya, in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, and now in Ukraine, we are not succeeding in creating the kind of liberal democracy that we believe can be the solution. 
And then the question, of course, how do we convince people that dialogue is uh, useful if they don't want it? Uh, I have been now 20 times in Ukraine after the war started, and people do not, do not want dialogue with Russians. And I remember this very well from uh, Balkan. The hardest thing with dialogue is not what's in the room. The hardest thing is to get people into the room. How do you convince people to actually come to Norway for three months or to come to Helsinki for three days to sit and talk with the enemy? But as I said, if we look at a country like Montenegro, uh, Drita Nabasovic, he was twice in uh, Lillehammer. I think around 15 people in the Montenegro parliament have been in uh, Lillehammer. The head of uh, radio television, Senagora, uh, Boris Raonic, has been in Lillehammer uh, at least 15 times. And uh, there is no doubt that the nonsense spirit, that the nonsense idea, and the nonsense idea is one society for all. We cannot have a Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia for one ethnic group. It, we have to have one society for all. And in the case of Macedonia, Soran Saev, he took this idea and had it in his uh, fight for becoming prime minister back in 2018. One society for all. And we analyzed uh, all textbooks in the Macedonian school system to find out what are they telling about each other. And one problem in uh, Western Balkan is simply that people know too little about each other. The educational system is such that you hear the narrative of your own people, but not about the others. Mm -hmm. And can you maybe uh, provide an example of a successful dialogue initiative that uh, had actually had a substantial impact on reconciliation? Yes, I have, uh, I have many examples. One, um, we had several participants from Yaitse, and I'm mentioning Yaitse since that's kind of the place you know, where the modern Yugoslavia was uh, uh, originated. Uh, one of the participants in Lillehammer was a volleyball trainer. So when he came back home to Yaitse, he started Nansen volleyball teams among girls 14 to 16, 16 to 18. These teams became so good because they used both Croatian and Bosnian players. When they got so good, parents started to come and see the games. Pa parents started to come to the away games and the parents started to be also a supportive group. In 2016, politicians in Bosnia-Herzegovina decided to divide the school system in Yaitse to build a new Muslim high school. The students protested, we are together, and everybody said, you have no chance. There is no way you can stop this division. It has been decided by the politicians, it will happen. But the students got support from the parents who had been traveling on some of these volleyball games. They got support from teachers. They got support from politicians because we in Lillehammer had invited the mayor, had invited the municipal uh, board, had invited teachers in the school and talked a lot about this. And at the end, it was no division of the high school in Yaitse and they won the Max van der Stoll prize, which was 50,000 euro handed by the High Commissioner for National Minorities in Hague, and they used those 50,000 euro to buy equipment for the one and only school. They were still going in together. Mm -hmm. Very good example. And uh, maybe going forward, uh, 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 how do you actually measure the impact and effectiveness of dialogue initiatives in fostering reconciliation? Because there are good examples, and I imagine there are not so good examples. So how do you 
decide on this? How do you measure it afterwards? Yes. I can tell you one very important thing because I stay in contact with many of the people that came to Norway 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And uh, um, they tell me that the, the value, the value of the dialogue work becomes more and more visible the longer time. So after 10 years, they would say, uh, I don't know, after 15 years, yes, maybe. After 20 years, wow, now I realize. I, um, I just had a meeting with uh, Daniela Popovic. She, I think she's the head of Red Communication in uh, Belgrade. She was in Norway in 1996. And she actually told me it was the best weeks of her life. I don't think she would have said that 10 years ago. So it's something about the value of dialogue becomes more visible as time passes by. But every NGO, every international organization, they want to evaluate after one year, after the project is over, and then you don't really see the effect. You don't see the consequences. I wanted also to ask you, because at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy, uh, we try to involve young people in peace building efforts. Uh, discussions about reconciliation, but also wider topics such as um, foreign and security policy, for example, uh, the core bread and butter of our think tank. And what advice would you give to young peace builders in the Western Balkans who are dedicating to achieving reconciliation in their own communities? The most, the most important advice I would give is to not expect immediate results. Um, I worked, I started my work in the Western Balkan in uh, 1995. That's almost 30 years ago. I was lucky, I have to admit, because I was full-time employed and paid by the Norwegian uh, Foreign Ministry. So in that sense, I did have time. Very often people who work on these issues, they work voluntarily, they work on their free time, and uh, that is very, 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 very hard. Um, but patience is extremely important. But 25 years is not a lot. So when we think about Western Balkan, or if we think about the Middle East, if we can make peace in the Middle East, the next 25 years. That's fantastic for those who will live the next two, 300 years. But very often when we have um, uh, negotiations, when we have meetings, we, we set aside two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and we want somehow things to happen too fast. Um, what is important for uh, Serbia, what's important for uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, Macedonia, is that it's possible for people to work full time. So in one way, the governments must set aside some money that can pay people in full positions. And it's not maybe to change society. If you use the language about security, being prepared for the future, et cetera, et cetera, it might be easier to, to get support for this kind of uh, work because Europe is changing. And uh, personally, I, I have to say things are not getting better. What is now happening in uh, Ukraine is dividing uh, Europe in a very dramatic uh, way. And uh, it's even more important that young people get motivated to, to use years of their life to make a better world. Also, of course, when I talk about the role of education, it's also in the universities. We need to educate people, not only in that old knowledge. We need to educate people in that knowledge that is needed for the future, which maybe is different from the kind of knowledge that helped us in the 20th century. I'm thinking very concretely that 
maybe the way we think about borders, territory, ethnicity, uh, states, uh, statehood, uh, passports, etc., uh, is part of the problem. I just uh, I was just in Montenegro and I rented a car, and they said we are sorry, but we don't have license plates. And I said, okay, but we have a paper in the car. You can show the police. And then I thought, wow, is that possible? Can we maybe drive cars without license plates? This is good news for Kosovo and Serbia. You can just have a paper in your car. You show the police. You don't need, you know. So the symbolic power of license plates, of passports, is, is uh, making things more difficult than it has to be. And uh, you gave the example earlier of the Nansen volleyball team from Yaitse as an example of successful dialogue initiative. But can I ask you to share a personal story or experience that particularly moved you or changed your perspective during your work in the Western Balkans? I had uh, one seminar with Serbs, Albanians from Kosovo. And uh, when we started the seminar, one Albanian, he got up and he started to argue, why are you here? He was accusing one Serb participant. And he was accusing that Serbian participant because he was convinced that he had put his own house on fire. So how can you, who put my house on fire, come here and pretend to be supportive of dialogue with us. He was talking for probably an hour, and most dialogue workers would say, shut up, let other people talk. But I really felt he had to come with his argument. When he was done, the man who was accused, he got up and told his story. When I listened to the first man, I was thinking, wow. How can that other man come here if he really put that house on fire? But then when I listened to the other story, I realized there is an other story here. And that story explains why he was not the one putting the house on fire. And they were sitting over lunch. They were talking. They were together for you know uh, several weeks. And I asked the Albanian who accused the Serb, do you still believe that he put your house on fire? And he said, no, I don't believe he did it. But I can never convince my children that he didn't do it. And uh, I just realized that accusations that are not allowed to somehow be, become modified or you know, tested if they exist alone, they become the truth. And uh, in, this, uh, in this case, it was such a demonstration of the importance of telling your story because those two people, they had been neighbors, they had been neighbors. And uh, the third man, he was the, his family was the first family in the village who got a television. So, that other family, they had the five, six kids, would come and sit and watch television every night until the television turned uh, snow. Why would he want to put their house on fire? But in the, in the scheme of the war, uh, these accusations started to grow. And, and uh, uh, it is such a good example of the importance of letting people come together and uh, talk as soon as possible. It's never, never too early for dialogue. It's sometimes too late. It's something that you said from that example that uh, particularly strikes me and um, kind of leads me to maybe this kind of last forward-looking question. It is, um, you know, how um, do we convince our children, uh, under quotation marks, future generations uh, that, uh, you know, 
reconciliation is the path forward. Uh, how do you see the future of reconciliation efforts in the Western Balkans? I think the most important um, arena is, as I said, education. In uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia, we analyzed all textbooks used in school. So uh, 399 textbooks. The biggest problem was not stereotypes, enemy images. The biggest problem was lack of information about the others. So take any little place, I think, in, in Western Balkan, because you still struggle with a lot of these uh, problems. Um, Prozorama. Prozorama, it's a small town in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. The kids don't fight. But if you take 12-year-old kids and give them a quiz about each other, they will score badly about each other because they don't know much about each other. And in uh, North Macedonia, we have educated teachers because we realized it's not enough to just write a new curriculum. You simply have to educate teachers to teach in a multicultural reality. And if you look at Europe, Europe is not anymore a um, national cultural you know, centers. I'll give you one example, which is not well known, but let's say in France, France is a civil society. If you apply for a job in the French state, there are many places you don't give your name and you don't give your address because your name and your address can make somebody even disqualify you because you belong to the wrong group or you have the wrong background instead of looking at your qualifications and your, uh, your uh, CV. And uh, we struggle with that, not only in the Western Balkan, we struggle with this also in France, also in Norway. So I think when I started to work, and this is important, when I started to work in 1995 in the Western Balkan, I felt we were very different from you. Today, I feel that most countries in Europe struggle with some of the same issues. And we can benefit a lot from talking with each other because Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Norway, Poland, France, we're all becoming multicultural realities because of immigration, because of refugees, because of the way uh, the world uh, works. So um, education, educate the new generation for a life in Europe is the main, the main goal. Great conclusion. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Breen. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for being our guest at the Lighthouse Podcast.